Um, hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining the PIM webinar. My name is Frank Place, Director of the CGIR Research Program on Policies, Institutions, and Markets, or otherwise known as PIM. Today, we are talking about measuring policy distortions along va agriculture value chains, lessons from Africa and Asia. This work is undertaken by PIM as part of our inclusive and efficient value chains research flagship. And I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today. <laughs> our speaker is Simla Takruz, is a research fellow in the Markets, Trade, and Institutions Division of IFPRI. He is part of the Globalization and Markets Research Program. She is also an active collaborator in PIM's flagship three that I've mentioned already, inclusive and efficient value chains, where she focuses on measurement of distortions along value agriculture value chains. Her research focus is modeling and analysis of biofuels, energy, and agriculture markets, particularly the integration of agriculture and energy markets in developing countries. Her research interests also include determinants of private agricultural, agricultural R&D spending in the United States. Uh, Simla received her PhD in economics from North Carolina State University in 2003. And before she joined IFPRI in 2009, she was at the Center for Agricultural and Rural Development at Iowa State University. So before I hand it over to Simla, let me explain how we will proceed with the webinar. So our speaker will begin very shortly with a presentation that you will see on your screens, and it will last about 30 minutes. During the presentation, we invite listeners to send in questions via the chat or, win or question windows that you'll see on the right side of your screens. Uh, we will collate the questions and try to group them uh, around similar topics and then uh, pose them one by one to Simla and she'll respond and, and you can keep the questions coming as we're posing uh, them to Simla. Uh, she'll address them as, and we'll try to get to as all of them if we can or most of them if, if we can. Um, and there'll be a way also to, to communicate uh, the qu uh, qu other questions you might have to Simla. She'll, she'll uh, give you her, her uh, email address at the end. So we, we do this, uh, we handle in this way to make the best use of time together. And we're also recording the webinar and we make it available on our website shortly after the live event for those of you, for those who are unable to join or those who would like to look at it again. So with that uh, and those brief remarks, let me hand it over to Simla and we're excited to hear the, uh, the, the webinar on distortions. Thank you so much, Frank. Good morning, everyone. I'm Simla Tokyos uh, from IFPRI. Today, I will be presenting some lessons we have learned from four studies that we have conducted within the PIM uh, value chain program. We focus on Ethiopia, India, Nigeria, and Tanzania, and we have analyzed nine different agricultural value chains. For Ethiopia, we have looked at ghost and sheep value chains. For India, we have analyzed oil seeds, and sugar, molasses, and ethanol value chains. For Nigeria, we focused on palm oil and cocoa value chains. And for Tanzania, we analyzed maize and groundnut value chains. Governments often intervene with policies, trade policies or domestic agricultural policies for specific agricultural commodities with the aim of supporting development and to protect their local markets. Although these policies are geared towards a specific agricultural commodity in most of the cases, they impact actually all economic agents along the complete value chain of that commodity with important implications for smallholder farmers. In this context, we believe it is necessary to understand and to measure how trade and agricultural policies affect producer incentives and price transmission along the complete value chain of an agricultural commodity. And how are we going to do this? In our studies, we utilize the pioneering work of Kruger, Schiff and Valdez of World Bank, specifically nominal rates of protection methodology. We took this methodology that is generally applied to the farm gate, and we applied it to different nodes along the value chain of an agricultural commodity. Specifically, nominal rate of protection measures the difference between a domestic price and a reference free market price that would exist without any government intervention. This graph here shows how a reference price is computed 
for the farm gate. We started an international price at the border and we compute, we make the necessary quality and quantity adjustments, use official exchange rates, and we add or subtract the margins along the value chain to compute a, a reference price at the farm gate. Then we compute, we compare that reference price to the farm gate price that is received by the farmers. And this gives us an indication of the policy distortion. These are the specific methodology, specific formulas we utilize for the studies on Africa, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Nigeria. For these three studies, we computed NRPs at different nodes of the value chain by comparing the relevant domestic price and the relevant reference price that exists at the same point of the value chain. This methodology allows us to estimate policy distortions to agricultural incentives along the value chain for that agricultural commodity. So, why did we do this within a value chain framework? Policy distortions affect price incentives along the complete value chain. So, from the smallholder producer to the consumer to the trader and to the wholesaler and the retailer, all economies along the value chain are being impacted by these policy distortions to prices. Compute distortions at the farm gate node, at the point of competition, in our case retail, and at the border. Here, this slide shows where we use micro data and where we use macro data sources. If we find uh, positive NRPs through our empirical analysis, this means that producers have received higher prices than what is prevailing in international markets. In other words, the policies have subsidized the producers. If the NRPs are negative, means that the producers have received lower prices than what is prevailing in international markets, meaning policies have taxed the producers. So let's start with the Tanzania study. We focused on maize and groundnut value chains. Tanzania's National Development Mission aims to transform Tanzania from an agricultural economy to a semi-industrialized economy supported by a productive agricultural sector. They do have a very wide range of policy framework, such as agriculture sector development strategy and national agricultural policy, which focus on development of agricultural value chains and supporting the transition from subsistence to commercial agriculture. So we picked two important value chains for Tanzania, maize and the groundnut, to understand the implications of these policies on the farmers and other economic agents. This is a very, very stylized uh, ver uh, description of the maize value chain in Tanzania. As you can see, most of the maize is consumed at the farm by smallholder farmers. A portion of that is being sold in secondary markets to traders or other uh, middlemen. In the urban market, either the millers buy the maize and produce maize flour and sell it to consumers, or consumers in some cases buy the grain themselves and, and do the maize flour or just eat the grain. There is an export market of maize in Tanzania. However, it is characterized by a lot of export bans and export taxes. There's a small feed sector that is being, that's being grown, and there is recently some efforts to create stocks of maize to, through NFRA and the World Food Program. Let's start with our results at the border. This, is, this graph shows the nominal rates of protection at the border for maize and maize flour. In our study period between 2006 and 2012 marketing years, Tanzania varies between a net exporter and a net importer for maize and maize flour in different years. The border NRPs for maize vary between positive and negative in our study period. But these results, we believe, imply an anti-trade bias. Then Tanzania is a net importer, that in the years that Tanzania is a net importer of maize, 
these imports face a tariff. Thus, we see positive NRPs in most of the years that Tanzania is a net importer of maize. That Tanzania is a net exporter of maize, it faces disincentives in the form of bans or taxes. Thus, we notice we have a lot of negative NRPs in most of the years during which maize is exported, which we believe implies some anti-trade uh, bias in Tanzanian maize markets. For the maize flour, all border NRPs are negative and in all study periods. Maize flour Tanzania is a net importer for three years and a net exporter for the rest of the period, and we have negative NRPs. For years during which Tanzania is a net exporter, this is expected, which is in line with the situation in the maize value chain because the value chain, the processing of maize is not much developed. But we were surprised by the negative era NRPs for years during which Tanzania is a net exporter, net importer. And how does this impact the farmers? In our studies, we try to generate compute NRPs at the farm gate as spatially disaggregate as possible. So we computed NRPs not for Tanzania on average, but for different regions. We also separated our study into regions with the long rainy season and the regions with the short rainy season. These are the maize NRPs at the farm gate for the short rainy season, and these are the ones for the long rainy season. And as you can see, in three years for which we have farm gate NRPs, for both seasons and in most of the regions, we have negative NRPs. For the two years at the beginning, 2008 and 2010 marketing year, we have Tanzania as a net importer in terms of trade status, and there is positive NRP at the border. However, in these years, we see that the farm gate NRP is negative in most regions. Although import tariffs provide support to maize farmers by increasing the price of the maize entering the country, these policies are not enough to protect farmers from the disincentives in the domestic maize market, which reverberate to the farm gate. In the last year of 2012, again, we have negative NRPs in most regions and in both seasons. In that year, Tanzania is a net exporter of maize as a trade status, and we have negative border NRPs. This shows that in this year, the disincentives in the export market are having effects in the domestic market and lowering the prices that the farmers receive. So there is some anti-trade bias, which is negatively affecting the Tanzanian farmers. Let's look at the groundnut value chain in Tanzania. Most of the groundnut farmers are smallholder farmers. Even if they sell it to other in secondary markets, to other traders and middlemen, there's really minimal shelling that is being done by them. Uh, in the urban market, there is some processing of groundnuts into groundnut oil. However, the processing facilities are quite low in number, and there's very little groundnut oil being produced in Tanzania. So we have an underdeveloped groundnut value chain. And what do the policy implications show us? The NRPs at the border for groundnuts and groundnut oil are negative in all years, regardless of what the trade status is for these two commodities. So Tanzania is a net importer, and a net exporter depending on the year of the study. The negative NRPs during the net exporting years show that Tanzanian exporters receive less than world market prices. But in groundnut market, we have minimal or no export taxes. And these negative NRPs, we believe, imply structural problems in the groundnut export market. The negative groundnut border NRPs in the net importing years show that Tanzania paid less than world market prices for groundnut imports. These, we believe, are because of the preferential groundnut import tariffs for Eastern Africa community countries with which Tanzania trades. So we have, they pay lower prices. For the years during which Tanzania is a net exporter of groundnut oil, the border NRPs are negative. Tanzania has not yet developed the processing and marketing stages of the groundnut value chain, 
So we believe this is because of the inefficiencies in the value chain that create disincentives in the export markets for granite oil. And how do these affect the farmers? Again, here we are showing the long rainy season regions for granite and RPs. We do not have results for short rainy season because most of the production is done in the long rainy season regions. And they are negative in all three years of the study for the farm gate NRP for all regions. During those three years, 2008, 2010, 2012, Tanzania is a net exporter of groundnuts, exporter of groundnut, groundnuts with negative border NRPs. And we can see the implications of that for the negative NRPs for the farmers. This suggests that disincentives in the export market reverberate through the domestic market and negatively impact farmers by reducing the prices that they receive for their grant. There is a high variation in Tanzania across regions for these maize and groundnut NRPs. To sum up very quickly, the anti-trade policy, anti-trade bias in policy hurts the farmers, especially in, in maize. It leads to lower profit margins for the farmers. There are disincentives in the export markets, which reduce the prices they receive relative to the international market prices. So let's look at Nigeria. Palm oil is an import-oriented sector in Nigeria, and cocoa value chain is an export-oriented sector. There is renewed focus in supporting agricultural development, including agricultural transformation agenda and agricultural promotion policy. These two sectors comprise an important share of Nigeria's agricultural sector and they affect smallholder farmers. For the palm oil value chain, they have different qualities of palm oil. So the palm oil value chain is kind of segmented with lower quality technical palm oil, high quality special palm oil, and palm kernel seed oil. This is being sold for different purposes to households, either for food or non-food consumption. And they do import palm oil, although they do have quite a lot of uh, <coughs> domestic production. As Nigeria is a net importer of palm oil with import tariffs imposed, the price that's entering the palm oil domestic market is high. This is shown in the positive border NRPs for the palm oil. These NRPs, when we compare them, are higher than the import tariffs, showing that importers have paid higher prices for palm oil, even though they account for the tariff, than what is prevailing in international markets. This could be due to some informal trade or structural problems created by traders in our study period. So what does this mean for the farmers? Palm oil NRPs at the farm gate are negative for all the regions. Again, similar to Tanzania, we see a wide variation for NRPs for different regions. Due to protective trade policy and to other domestic, because of other domestic initiatives, the NRPs at the farm gate are positive, showing that the Nigerian government has effectively protected the farmers. One more thing we have noticed is that there is a difference in the farm gate NRPs over time in two years. Farmers receive higher prices relative to world prices in 2012 compared to 2010, despite the fact that the international prices were lower in 2012. We believe this finding indicates that oil palm farmers in Nigeria were also insulated from the price shocks in world markets through policy. Let's look at cocoa value chain. We have quite a lot of smallholder uh, producers for cocoa. The cocoa value chain is not much developed with very small volume of uh, cocoa products being produced, such as cocoa paste, uh, cocoa butter, etc. There is an export market for cocoa, cocoa beans, but it is being dominated by three big companies. So we have few exporters dominating the export market. Nigeria is a net exporter of cocoa beans and all the cocoa products in our study period. And what do we see at the border for cocoa value chain? So they are a net exporter in all years, and border NRPs are all negative for all four commodities. Nigerian exporters receive lower prices than those seen in world markets. 
Part of it is due to the perceived quality gap for Nigerian cacao bean. They receive lower prices for, for, compared to Ghana and Ivory Coast, for example. And part of it is because of the export market being dominated by three firms, which lowers the export prices for traders. So we have lack of export taxes, lack of quotas, lack of bans, but we still have negative border NRPs. So policies such as export expansion grants have not been affecting in helping the exporters. When we look at the cacao bean NRP at farm gate, one, again, there is variation across regions, but we also see that the negative NRPs at the farm gate for all cacao producing regions. This is in line with what we found for the export market, meaning that the disincentives cacao bean export market reverberate through the domestic market and the farm gate, despite the Nigerian government's cacao support policies. So it is not the domestic agriculture policies are not enough to help the farmers. So just very quickly, what we learned from Nigeria study, negative NRPs at the farm gate for all cacao producing regions suggest that the disincentives in the export market negatively affect the farmers despite domestic agricultural support policies. Because of the protective trade policy and other domestic initiatives, NRPs at the farm gate for palm oil producers are positive, showing that the Nigerian government has protected the farmers. But this also means that the palm oil prices in the country are high, increasing the prices that are paid by the consumers. So for Ethiopia, we went in a different direction. We wanted to look at the livestock sector and we focused on small ruminant value chains. Ethiopia has a large livestock sector in East Africa, and small ruminants are the second to capital in terms of the total livestock population. They do export live animals in, in high volume. And this is what we are focusing in our study. We are not looking at the meat market, mm. but we are looking at the sheep and the goat market. So no meat, just the animals. This is the it's very stylized description of the sheep and the goat value chains. There are many smallholder farmers that are keeping sheep and goats, but they, there is really few buyers that is buying this from the farmers, so they are at a disadvantage. In Addis, there are very few sellers, but they have a lot of consumers, so there is some uh, um, inefficiency along the value chain of the sheep and goats. They do have a large export market for sheep and goats, which they sell to Middle Eastern countries. And what do we see? So these are the NRPs at the retail point of the value chain and farm gate for the sheep. They are negative in all years of the study. And these are the NRPs for the goats at two points of the value chain for all years. They are negative. So what did we learn? They are negative indicating a strong deviation of producer and retailer prices from the comparable export prices in Djibouti. So the producers and the retailers have uh, paid, have received less prices than what is available in the export market. The negative NRP suggests that uh, government of Ethiopia has not effectively protected the sheep and the goat keeping farmers. Producers have greater disincentives than the retailers, as the NRPs at the farm gate are lower than NRPs at the retail. To sum up for Ethiopia, policies of government are taxing value chain participants rather than protecting them. One thing we notice when we are conducting this study is that we use excess cost data throughout the value chain based on household survey. We did this because we want to separate policy-induced distortions from the other sources of efficiencies in the market. So we can just say NRP shows the policy distortion. But these are very high and positive. And this shows that there are some high market inefficiencies along the sheep and goat value chain in Ethiopia that is separate from the policy distortion. And the final study is for India. What I would like to note is that for India study, we use a new methodology that, that we developed ourselves with my co-author, Fad Majid of University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. This is a new methodology that we apply to Indian oil seeds 
and the sugar, molasses, and ethanol value chains. Again, in our program with, within PIM, we are looking at a value chain perspective. So we wanted to ask ourselves, what else can we do to understand the value chain and how policies impact the value chain? He extended the nominal rate of protection methodology to a value chain framework. And we knew that there are different types of value chains, so we wanted it to be very flexible. This methodology can be applied to a new value chain created by policy, such as the ethanol market in India that's being created by the ethanol mandate, a value chain in which a byproduct is created in the processing of a commodity, for example. Molasses is a byproduct when you're producing sugar from sugar cane or a value chain in which processing of a commodity generates new products, such as when you process rapeseed, you generate rapeseed meal and oil. But it should be noted that in agricultural sector, not all commodities are tradable. So our methodology is applicable to two cases of value chains when the commodity is tradable in international markets, such as oil seeds or sugar. But it's also applicable to a value chain when the commodity is not Trade is non tradable, such as the case of sugar cane. So, you don't trade sugar cane or sugar beet, you make sugar, and then that's what you export or import. So, this is a very, very simple, simple example of our methodology. Please go back to the original article in the Journal of Agricultural Economics for the details. He created what we call a value chain NRP, it integrates the NRP of the raw commodity with the NRP of the downstream products. If you look at the first formula, you will see that we have taken the prices of the downstream products, such as oil and meal, and we converted them into their seed equivalent using an input-output coefficient. Then we compute NRPs for these downstream products, but they are in normalized at the commodity level that is being produced by the farmer. That's what we mean by seed equivalent. Then we add the value chain NRP for these downstream products with the NRP of the original raw commodity and to get the value chain NRP. This can be added because they are in the same unit. They are all normalized at the commodity that the farmer is producing. We believe it shows us an aggregate measure of all policy impacts on the commodities in the value chain. And it makes it possible to compare and contrast the impacts of policy on different economic agents along the value chain. And it does that in a very consistent manner. Let me explain our methodology by showing you some results. This is the value chain NRP for the ethanol, molasses, sugar, sugarcane value chain. So you'll see two graphs in here, which is the result in sugarcane equivalent and the result in sugar equivalent. The reason for that is when we looked at data at different states in India, part of the farm gate prices were in sugar cane, or sugar was were for sugar cane, and part of them were for sugar. So we wanted to create a consistent methodology that you can compare across. So we converted part of the downstream products to sugar and part of them to the sugar cane equivalent. The results show us that both sugar cane producers and sugar mills are protected, but sugar mills are protected at much higher rates. So gains are not evenly distributed among value chain agents. Producers of the downstream products are, kept, are taxed. The molasses value chain NRP is negative, indicating the molasses sector is not protected, it is taxed. This is due to much lower domestic molasses prices than international molasses prices. This reflects the lack of development of domestic molasses market and the efforts to keep molasses prices low to assist ethanol producers who are the major users of molasses. Ethanol and molasses value chain NRP is also negative, but higher than molasses NRP. This shows that both molasses and ethanol markets are disincentivized in India, but their taxation is lower for ethanol than for molasses. The ethanol price in India is fixed by legislation below international prices because they are trying to benefit consumers of ethanol, which are refiners and blenders. The net subsidization of this value chain, which is positive, it's at the end of the graph, molasses commodity value chain NRP and ethanol molasses commodity value chain NRP, those are positive, but that's because of the much higher 
subsidization of sugar and sugarcane producers. For the oil seeds value chain, we have groundnut and rapeseed studies. They show that oil seed producers have been subsidized by the government. So we have positive groundnut and rapeseed NRPs. But at the same time, we also see that meal and oil value chain NRPs are positive, and in the case of rapeseed, quite high. This shows that the crushing industry in India is subsidized enough that even though they buy seeds and nuts at much higher prices, the net impact of that positive policy is positive because of the protection granted NRPs are high. So they pay higher granted prices, but there's enough subsidization for the crushing industry to make them in, in net terms protected. We also observe that the production in the rapeseed value chain is more geared towards the processing side compared to the groundnut value chain. So to sum up, in India, farmers are being protected. Producers of ethanol and molasses are being taxed, whereas consumers of those two commodities are being subsidized. Producers of meal and oil are being subsidized enough to aid the development of the domestic crushing industry. What we notice in this new methodology is when we analyze producers along the different along the different points of the value chain, we find that producers experience different impacts from Indian government's policies, some positive and some negative. So what have we learned from these four studies? We learned that policies may have overlapping and sometimes opposed outcomes along the value chain. And this has important implications for smallholder farmers. When you're trying to help the farmers, you increase the prices for these commodities, which may increase the price that the consumers are paying. When you're trying to help the consumers by lowering the food prices, this might depress the prices that the farmers are receiving. So you may not always know the complete impact of your policy framework if you do not look at implications along the complete value chain. In this context, we believe it is important to encourage development of value chains because this will benefit smallholder producers and consumers at the same time. There are different ways that this can be achieved. Our ideas are as follows. There could be efforts to reduce transportation costs, which may help farmers bring their goods to the urban markets more directly. This will lower the prices that consumers pay and increase the prices that farmers receive. In a, on a similar venue, reducing margins received by middlemen and traders along the value chain it would increase the prices received by the farmers and reduce the prices paid for the, by the consumers are important for all economic agents. When we looked at the processed goods, downstream value chain products, notice that they were not much developed in Africa. By aiding the development of processing facilities that produce downstream products domestically, rather than importing them, would help the consumers for maize flour, palm oil, groundnut oil, etc. And we believe that when you analyze policy distortions along the different nodes of the value chain, the policymakers can decide better where to focus interventions. What we would like to do is, based on after these four studies, engage with policymakers and stakeholders to present our findings. And we are conducting some reaching out efforts to show what we have found. And after these four studies, there is our research headed. What we would like to do is to do this along the complete food system flow. We would like to connect food system flow from the producer to the consumer, including all of them, by linking micro and macro data. To do this along a complete food system flow, you need a wide range of both micro data and the macro data. And in order to use the, these two types of data consistently, you need data interoperability. And that's where we believe ontology comes into play. We would like to combine a value chain analysis with ontology and with big data in order to expand this analysis to a complete food system flow. We believe the big data, especially the big data platform of CJR, and the ontology practice can help in a more comprehensive analysis of policy distortions 
along agricultural value chains. Thank you so much for your time and your interest. So we are ready for your questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Simla. Um, we're, we're, while we're trying to collect some questions, let me just start off with a couple of, around the, the methods and then we'll move on to the findings and the implications perhaps as we go. But you know, so your, your, your analyses rely a lot on the collection of good high quality data on prices and uh, at, di at different levels. And so we have farm gate prices, middlemen, sometimes you have retail sectors and the border prices. And in some cases, uh, let's say at the farm gate, there could be millions of possible data points uh, out there. And then you, know, you get fewer and fewer. So I was wondering if you could take us through how in the different countries you're able to collect uh, prices that give you a good uh, overall aggregation of what's happening in the country? Oh, that's an excellent question. Because uh, first, I would like to mention what you might you know, you said at the beginning, in terms of the data quality, yes, we collected quite an extensive uh, data, both micro data and macro data, but we noticed that for a lot of these developing countries, there's definitely problems with the data quality. So whatever we collected from a source, we had to compare the prices we have found to other data sources and to compare them and to see which one was reliable and which one was not. In certain cases where they were saying, different things and if we had three data sources from them we went with the two data sources that are consistent with each other so basically for Tanzania and Nigeria for the farm gate prices we use LSMS data of World Bank so they do provide uh, quite uh, disaggregated data especially especially for different regions but the time series is that is either three years or four years and we took the LSMS data, we had to conduct sensitivity analysis and some cleaning to come up. For example, in Tanzania, we knew from the climate uh, or weather maps uh, through uh, FuseNet which region is long rainy season, which region is short rainy season. So we had to clean up when the prices were mislabeled. Uh, later on, with the LSMS data, we compared them to national statistics for Tanz published by Tanzanian and Nigerian government. Um, in certain cases, such as Nigeria, we went to ECO for cocoa bean prices, compared them to LSMS data. We went to C4 prices to compare them to palm oil prices from LSMS. For Ethiopia, we realized, relied on an excellent survey, household survey uh, done by ICARDA. Our partner in, for the Ethiopia study is Bill Kasi from ICARDA, and he had a household survey. So we knew that the microdata collect we collected was reliable. For India, we relied on Government of India data set, but we did a lot of data cleaning. Mm -hmm. That's for the microdata, micro data. And for the micro data, macro data, we relied on FAO stats, World Bank, UN Comtrade, um, Eurostat, USDA, and other data sources for the margins along the value chain for uh, Tanzania and uh, Tanzania we found an excellent Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation technical report that publishes these margins for uh, Nigeria we used uh, for Nigeria India and for uh, Ethiopia we computed the excess costs along the margins ourselves but especially the data process was very um, time consuming because of the data quality issues that we encountered. The other part was that's why we are moving on to ontology after this, is to link the price data from the micro component to the um, price data at the macro component. As you can see in this graph, you know, what the farmer produces is maybe a maize cob or maize kernel. And this is what you will see in the LSMS data labeling. But throughout the value chain, Either it is being classified under a different food classification or it is being processed and it's becoming a maize flour or maize oil or the consumers are producing ugali and tortillas. So you need to be able to use them in a consistent manner and map them to each other. And we did that, but without the help of ontology, it was difficult. So in the next step, we will take advantage of ontology. So I want to say it's not enough that you have data but you need to really look at the data quality and also look at the data labels, which is ontology, in order to do this in a consistent manner. Right. Yeah, that's great. 
And um, maybe just related to that, just one, one other quick question is that, is there a difference in the ease of finding high quality data depending on the commodity? Because um, you, you, I, I really appreciated that you covered many different kinds of commodities in these four, four countries. Oh, so for, for example, for maize, of course, it was very easy to find maize data for Tanzania or for the macroeconomic data. And for, um, as a commodity, if you're looking at that, but we had quite a lot of problem finding granite data. And we had a lot of problem for Tanzania. And we had a lot of problem finding high quality data for Nigeria. The data was published, but it wasn't very good quality. And there were inconsistencies in data set. But maize is because it's a food security crop. There's always maize prices, so it was the easiest for us to do. And India publishes so much data, which is in English, so it was much, much easier. Oh, good. Um, maybe if we can come to some of, some of the results. So I, I really appreciated that, uh, you know, the extra, okay, so you presented the, the raw data, the, the, the distortions, positive or negative, uh, um, in terms of protection or taxing. And then uh, the team obviously went, dug a little bit deeper to try to see, well, what really was driving those things? So how did you, how did you kind of, you, did you approach it in, a, in the same way in different countries to try to look towards different kinds of policies? You, know, you refer quite a bit to uh, export and uh, trade policies, but also domestic uh, program support policies. How do you kind of uh, investigate that in a comprehensive way to come up with your interpretation? Okay. So let me go back to my then methodology slide to explain. So here we put in our study, we used uh, two types of uh, different uh, NRPs for different uh, points of the value chain. So when we compute distortions at the border for um, Tanzania and for Nigeria, we com compare the in prevailing international market prices to what the traders are seeing at the border, either they're importers or exporters. So thus, when we look at the distortions at the border, we can directly compare them to the import tariff or the export tax policy of Tanzania and Nigeria to see whether these distortions are higher or lower than what the trade policy suggests. Mm. So in generally, they are very consistent with what the trade policy suggests, so we are just giving a different value. But in certain cases, although we, were, we try to do this as correctly as we can, it is, we believe, showing market structural problems. For example, if the export market is dominated by three, term, three firms, you're going to show that the policy distortions at the border are going to be different than the trade policy because of the structural problem. Then you're looking, then for the distortions at the border, you're looking at the trade policy. In the Kruger, Schiff and Wallace methodology, basically they are analyzing domestic agricultural policy. It's a little bit different. And in MAFAP, for example, if you're MAFAP, they are looking at distortions at farm gate and distortions at point of competition. For those things, then you're comparing them to what the domestic agricultural policy is. However, these distortions are showing you not the impact of a specific policy, but the impact of all domestic policies at that point of the value chain. So I'm not specifically looking at the impact of a cocoa support scheme in Nigeria, but all the domestic agricultural policies, including maybe even subsidies, input subsidies to the farmers for these agricultural policies. So it's an overall impact mm -hmm. study. Great. So we had a, a, a specific question related to this, uh, trying to understand the results. Um, uh, when it came, came, uh, one question that came in was recognizing that in some places you could have dominance by larger farmers versus smaller farmers, and where you might have larger farmers involved in a sector, the, perhaps the farm price could be higher yeah. than with, with uh, small farmers who don't have the negotiation power. And so the question was, uh, and there, the example was maybe between oil palm and cocoa and in, in Nigeria, for example. Um, were, did, were you able to look at that issue at all? Oh, no, we did not have, um, for this, we did not have margins for um, excess, ex margins for between the producers and the middleman specifically for the different types of farms. Mm -hmm. So we did not have that, those margins separately. At the same time, through the LSMS data, we only have prices at regional level. We can maybe look at which region is dominated by smallholder producers mm -hmm. and which region is being dominated by cooperatives that are bigger producers, bigger landholders. 
but because of the data availability, we did not look at that. So it just gives you an average right. regional price. Although we try to separate it regionally, we do not have that specific margin. Right. Um, maybe just another question on the implications of the results. So um, obviously, you know, the the, the prices are, are are very important in terms of incentives for farmers to produce and uh, and invest in, in certain commodities and and also through the through the value chain are there kind of now attempts to since now that you have this distortion data then to, to try to follow up to see whether it really did have impacts on production investment productivity those kinds of things in these commodities oh yeah. excellent <laughs> thank you so much actually we do <laughs> but because uh we do have uh, in, in mtrd we do have a partial uh, equilibrium model for india mm -hmm. Uh, at state level, so the production is desegregated at the state level. And although I presented national level NRPs, we do have desegregated state level NRPs for India. So one step that we would like to do is to take these NRPs that we computed because these are policy distortions and include them into our model because they are going to impact the price transmission uh, along the value chain. And we are going to run some scenarios with policy distortions without policy distortions. So we can then see how much these policies impacted area, yield, food consumption, feed consumption, stocks, stock levels, exports and imports. But we do have the model for India, so we can do that for India pretty quickly. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have the modeling, I do not have the modeling capacity for Tanzania, Nigeria, and Ethiopia yet, but this is not very hard to do. You can take these NRPs because these are policy, plug them into a simulation model, and you can run scenarios to see the impact on the rest of the agricultural sector. So we will do that for India in the near future. Oh, that's great. So then, I, it, but it sounds like, you, of course, you need to control for other things. And in, in one of the studies, I think Ethiopia, you said you tried to tease out the market inefficiencies yeah. from the policy distortions. And so, uh, to, do you, is it easy to find data on the market inefficiencies in, in these countries to be able to run those simulations? Oh, okay. So actually, we did that for all four studies. Okay. Oh, okay. We, we had to do that because yeah. otherwise the distortions you compute yeah. for prices is going to reflect so many other things. So right. we try to subtract them as much as we can. Mm -hmm. So we did that for Ethiopia, and we showed that because in the slides, because the excess costs were very high, what Girma has found through the through the survey. So, and we did that for all of them. Um, in the modeling framework, uh, we did publish them, these excess costs and the margins we have found in our papers. They're available online and I showed them. And in a, they are very important and we saw that they were quite high in many value chains. So there's a lot of market inefficiency happening that is negatively affecting the producer, maybe even more than the policies. Right. So we found that especially in Africa, the margins that the middleman, the processors, the wholesalers receive is quite high. That is hurting the farmer and the consumer at the same time. But in a modeling framework, yes, you can definitely tease out the margins, the excess costs, and see the implications for the commodity and the agricultural sector in a simulation framework. Right. And we have the data for that, and they're published uh, for all the studies. Great. Now, in terms of trying to um, Building this, so you, we've been building this evidence based on the distortions, the, now the implications, and so forth. And so I guess that then the next thing is to see if these can be used in decision making processes for either, I think you mentioned about uh, identifying key areas for focus or um, point, you know, pointing uh, investments that way, or even trying to understand well, what, what, what are the policies that uh, could be uh, usefully improved to, to both benefit consumers and, and, and producers. And so, I so are there um, any uh, through through your work uh, at the moment any uh, processes in place to try to just you know uh, bring the results to the decision makers? Oh, so we are now that we have finished these studies, we are uh, we have just published them. So we are trying to reach out to a wide audience, not only policymakers and stake, but also stakeholders, and tr trying to make the results of these studies as publicly available as possible. For example. Uh, we do have a blog coming up on the food security portal for our study on Tanzania and food security portal that is run by IFPRI has a wide uh, reach to audiences. So we are going to take advantage of that and we are going to take advantage of the 
uh, if resources to reach out to policymakers. So we first want to make it publicly available and then show the policymakers what we have found, and then they can make the decisions in terms of the policy implications themselves. Okay, a couple of those good questions are coming in as we have been asking. So there was a question about whether you use system dynamics to analyze entire value chain and policy effects together, whether that's been done. No, we, uh, we have not conducted that type of analysis, but we'll definitely take a look into that. Okay. Um, I think, and there was a question, well, uh, there was a comment, I think that there was, uh, whether maybe if you can, um, since you've looked at uh, several different kinds of commodities, are there any kind of generalizable lessons on, on difference between, say, staple food and subsistence food, how governments approach those versus more of these commercial industrial commodities like the cocoa and others, and more of the export ones? Oh, I think it's very hard to find one simple implication because we have done four countries that are very different from each other. Mm -hmm. uh, we noticed that, that, for example, for maize in Tanzania, definitely in order to increase the availability of the maize supply in the country, they do have quite a lot of export bans or export taxes in years where they believe the production mm -hmm. is low. But at the same time, we found that the NRPs for the producers are low in those years as well. So although they are trying to protect the staple crop and the food security, it might have inadvertently negative implications for the farmers and indirectly on the food supply. Uh, but we haven't done a policy exercise, simulation model exercise to say that. So I'm just saying indirectly it implies. But we noticed that especially for commodities such as cocoa beans, where if Nigeria is exporting, but they have not develop their downstream value chains, they can definitely produce cocoa paste, cocoa paste, cocoa butter, and chocolate, or other types of uh, byproducts domestically and export them in higher volume rather than exporting the cocoa beans. Because in the end, they export cocoa beans, they are being processed somewhere else, and they import quite a lot of cocoa butter and cocoa paste. So this is not very good for them. So we believe that we have learned that really um, promoting development of the domestic agricultural value chain is much better for the countries, such as being done for the crushing industry subsidization in India, because they want to produce the meal and oil themselves domestically, rather than just export the soybean, rapeseed, and groundnut. So they want to pr protect it so that it is being developed. And actually, this is the case for what's happening in the soybean markets in China. They really want to import soybeans, and then develop the crushing industry and produce the soybean meal and soybean oil themselves. So we believe this is the way to go. But again, this is our interpretation of the results, and other people may disagree. Mm -hmm. Oh, very good. I was, I was one also struck by some of the results that show a lot of in, you know variation over time. As you say, whether they're like you say, whether they flip from being net, net exporters and importers or some changes in shifts in policies. That is true. And there could be other reasons why governments are shifting in policies. And that instability itself, I wonder if, is that something also that you look at and, and, and can that instability itself kind of be a hindrance and a roadblock to investment? Oh, that's an excellent question. Because in part, we looked at why we had so much volatility. And part mm -hmm. of it was the NRPs changed over time because the trade status changed. So from export tax, you are going into an import tariff, for example, on average. But part of it was because of the, if I'm being honest, volatility in international markets. Some countries, such as Nigeria and palm oil, insulated their farmers from the volatility in international markets to different policies. And in some cases, they were not able to uh, insulate them. So there is this component of international market volatility that is being transferred to farmers or not. So that's what has happened because in our study period, because of the shortness of the LSMS data, which is like three years or four years, uh, it's very hard for us to say what's happening in terms of time series properties mm -hmm. of these studies. But there are other institutions that do publish these um, agricultural policies uh, on a daily, on an annual basis, such as OECD, FAO, MAFAP, and Inter-American Development Bank. We also have. Uh, 
between PIM egg incentives projects, which is combining these international organization databases. Egg incentives is part of the PIM uh, value chain program. So our, read, our viewers or readers can go to these websites and take a look at them to see what's happening over the longer term. So I'm going to plug in egg incentives one more time. <laughs> Very good. OK, well, I think uh, we've, we've almost reached the end. And there, we, there's no more questions that I can see coming in. But it was a very good, lively uh, Q&A session. And I want to, again, thank uh, uh, Simla for the webinar. Went, uh, I learned a lot. And I hope that others did as well. And uh, we, we, I think this, this is very important research. And it's, uh, it's very good. It, 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 but it looks challenging. It's not easy to do. Uh, when you really dig into a value chain in the country, we can see that it demands a lot of uh, careful attention to quality and issues and, and so forth. Um, so, but we, we hope that we can, uh, that these results uh, do uh, reach uh, decision makers and also help to influence our colleagues in the CG to, to look at uh, and focus some of their attention on some of these priority areas uh, where we're, we're, we're seeing high distortions <laughs> uh, and implications. So thank you uh, once again, Simla, and thanks to everybody for participating. And we will have, uh, stay tuned because uh, you'll see uh, an invitations to uh, a few other uh, webinars before the, the end of the year. So thank you very much. <laughs>